Hey, it's Heidenreich, former WWE World Tag Team Champion with the Road Warriors, Legion of Doom. I'm about to do a career interview with TheHannibalTV.com. So check it out. All my friends, you know where to find me. Before we actually start, uh, your face is a little bruised out. Just before anyone makes up any uh, rumors right. about you or anything, do you want to explain what happened to your face? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can show you if that's okay, huh? Sure. Yeah, yeah, well, what, what actually happened, I had a cyst off that had been forming up here for several years, getting larger and larger, and I had been putting it off. Finally, I had it uh, removed, and it was just fatty tissue, no cancer, but uh, I had that done on Monday. I was trying to get the thing the done, the lump taken out before this, because you take out the pictures and you got the lump, but it ended up being worse, I think, with the stitches, and it bruised, you know? I've been icing, but I stood on my feet today and it looked like it, it bruised and got worse. But uh, that's what's going on. That's why I got the hat and glasses because I just don't want to look like Rocky, yeah. you know. But you're okay. Oh though. yeah, everything's good, yeah, yeah. How yeah. long is the uh, recovery period going to be? Well, I think they take the stitches out of 10 days, so that'll be uh, Wednesday or Thursday of this following week. And then I imagine the bruising will be going another week or 10 days. Because I've been icing and I'm going to start doing ice and heat contrast you know which gets the blood out of it so yeah I'll be okay and uh, the operation you were telling me off camera it was covered so you didn't have to worry about yeah yeah operation. yeah yeah thankfully my dad's wife's a doctor and it was somebody she knew so yeah it was a blessing and uh, speaking of your dad to start this interview from the <clears throat> beginning uh, what was your childhood like oh man I had a uh, I always say I had the best childhood out of anybody I've ever met my mom and dad uh, were together the whole time I was growing up. Um, my father was uh, a, a karate instructor in a dojo, so I grew up in a Shotokan a dojo. From the time I could walk, I was doing karate, and you know, at six years old, I started training and had my black belt like at 10 or 11. So that was me and my dad. You know, were really close. We always worked together. He trained with me in football. Like we had a block and dumb we built out of an army uh, bag, those army duffel bags. We had that tied around the tree to hit every day. And uh, you know, I just grew up training a lot, you know, always working out to try to, you know, cause I was always in love with sports. So I knew I'd end up somewhere in that in that world, which I did, you know. So yeah, my childhood was phenomenal. My dad's like my hero, my best friend, you know. What sports did you play other than karate and football? Uh, well, I was uh, football, I got. I played uh, basketball in middle school. The middle schools in New Orleans Catholic schools don't have contact football, but when you get into high school, I started in ninth grade. So in high school, I did basketball, football, uh, track, shot put, and discus, and then uh, also powerlifting and some wrestling. But it was too much. The rest, actually, the the, the real mat wrestling. The school I was at was state champions every year. And those guys were like vision quests, like psycho crazy. The coach Charbonneau was like a nut. So I didn't, I, I didn't want to, I actually didn't want to do real wrestling because it was so strenuous and physically demanding, making weight and all. So, uh, but I mean, I pretty much tried everything, you know. But football was a big, my football is my first love, I always said. And uh, Mid-South Wrestling, I guess, would have been popular in New Orleans. Did you know about it at all? When you I were? watched as a child. It was on Saturday mornings. Yeah, Saturday mornings would have Mid-South and the Godzilla shows, because that's when they had the cartoons, but not many. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I did watch Mid-South Wrestling as a child. Did you have any favorites at that time? Uh, I mean, I don't really have, I didn't have a favorite in, in, in that. I mean, I remember missing Link and Hacksaw and those guys. Uh, actually, as I grew up and started watching wrestling more in high school and college, I always liked S Sid, Sid Justice, Sid, because yeah. he looked so scary and he looked believe. I mean, you didn't question that guy's sanity and if he could kill you, you know. So. Did you ever get to meet him in later years? I did. Uh, I did the Juggalos show, the Gathering. Yeah. Yeah. That's the. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh it's, yeah, I've heard It's of like that. three days out in the woods. It's cool. Bloody Mania, they call it. Yeah. Sid was at that uh, when I worked for them, and it was insane because I was the opening match, and everybody else was like WWE legends and Hall of Famers. It was nuts, man. Uh, yeah, but I did meet him, and I think his son might have been there. Yeah, his son was a big, big brother or something. Yeah, or something like yeah. I know he got messed up on that injury from WCW. I don't think he ever fully recovered when he broke his leg. Yeah, and he did that one-legged boot. 
because I, I believe that kind of slowed his whole deal down, man, because he yeah. compound fractured his leg. So, yeah, but he's a big dude still, you know. So when did you start realizing that you were an outstanding football player? Uh, well, in high school, my senior year in high school, uh, things kind of fell in place. Because actually the original high school I went to was in Metairie, a suburb of New Orleans. But we had to move to New Orleans because my grandmother got sick. On my mom's side, we had to care for her. So the high school I ended up being in their district was Brother Martin. So I only went there one year. But when I went there, uh, the, the coaches promoted me better and I ended up making like all city, all district, and all Louisiana and ended up getting signed with Mississippi State. Uh, Brother Martin High School was where I graduated. They just seemed to turn out a lot of players every year. They had parade all Americans and guys end up at Michigan, Notre Dame. Some schools just seem to know how to develop talent and have rapport with colleges. So going to Brother Martin was the best thing I ever did moving. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I we ended up, I made all those district teams and league and city and state. And then I did my visits and I went to Mississippi State on a football scholarship. What yeah. are some of your greatest accomplishments there? In football? In uh, college football. Oh, so. college. Well, let's see, man. Uh, man, I had a crazy, I've always had crazy, uh, like stuff happened along the way uh, to, to get to success. Cause at State, I I signed with Mississippi State mostly for the coach who was there. Coach Tom Good was my offensive line coach. He played for the Colts and he had a Super Bowl ring. He was offensive lineman. So he was like a dad, father figure hero. And after the first year they fired him cause we had a terrible season. So he left, but the first year I had, I tore my MCL and was in a cast. And then the second spring that I was eligible for after being richer, I blew my knee out. So I was on crutches like a year, the first year and a half, two years there. So I ended up leaving because the coach I loved and the whole staff got fired and ended up transferring to a one double A school called Northeast Louisiana University in Monroe which is, uh, they had won a national championship and one conference championship. So that was where I did really well. I made all conference, all Southland conference and uh, all academic, all Louisiana. And uh, I had a lot of success there, you know. And you ended up having some experience with the Washington Redskins. How did yes. That come about? Uh, well, I mean, uh, when I came out eligible for the draft, when I got done with college, uh, I was working out for all the teams that would come through and uh, I didn't get drafted so they signed me a free agent and uh, that was the year that they had won the Super Bowl. Uh, but uh, the team was really loaded and going up there I really, you know, you kind of think you're pretty tough and all and it was like a huge reality check going up to the Redskins with the Hogs. Yeah. I always say, uh, I mean, I really wasn't mentally or physically ready like I thought I was. It was like shell shock because I got cut and I didn't perform well. It was the worst I'd ever performed and it was like a big disappointment, but I think it had to happen for me to advance because after that, I went to the Saints, the Falcons, and then pursued football for like eight or nine more years trying to get to the NFL. So, you know, those failures happen and you grow, right? You know, through them, injuries and whatnot, stuff that you can't see when it happens. It ends up, you know, being something that's good. Was Goldberg in the Falcons at the yeah, time? Yeah, 94, he was, yeah. Did you know him at yes, all? Yes, yeah, we used to go, he was a D lineman, and I was offense, so we used to headbutt, you know, going against each other in drills. Yeah. And uh, he was a tough guy, really good football player. He, he bounced around several NFL teams, he had a lot of uh, injury, I know shoulder and injury, injury problems that slowed him down, but he was tough, as tough as they come, and a really good guy. What do you think of him uh, coming back to wrestling now? Oh, I think it's great, man. He's, a, I've, he's always been super nice, down to earth guy, and I think he's good for wrestling, you know, his character, and uh, I mean, he's always represented himself in wrestling well. I, I've never seen or heard of anything negative from him, and I love him as a personal friend and a, a guy. It's, it's good to see him do so well. You think he's going to stick around for a while after WrestleMania? Uh, well, they say he wants to wrestle with his new son. He has a young son, you know? And I mean, if that's a big deal, I think he will. And he he's looks in tremendous shape. And he obviously doesn't have too many injury problems. So, yeah, I mean, I could see him staying for a few more years, you know? And you also ended up in the CFL. We're from Canada, of course. So, uh, I guess that was at the time when they had American teams. Yeah, which, you know, I tell people I was in the CFL and I tell them I played in America. They're like, wait, uh, how'd that happen? Well, like, like you say, 94, 95, they expanded to the States. 
and uh, Atlanta released me in 94 and the Shreveport Pirates team picked me up instantly. So I went there and signed a two year deal. Uh, started, I forget, I think they played 18 games maybe. I ended up starting 10 games one year and 18 the next. And I got a lot of experience and I had a tremendous uh, honor there. I, our head coach was Forrest Gregg, who's in the NFL Hall of Fame. He played for Vince Lombardi and he's an offensive lineman. So that was a tremendous experience. Uh, I was there uh, two years and then 95 I left there and went, uh, actually moved to arena football in 96, which I always said the beating money ratio is not good because you get really beat up. It's indoor turf and you play both ways. Uh, but, you know, I moved on. I don't know if you have questions in that, but I moved on to NFL Europe arena and then tried back with the NFL and then ended up going into wrestling, you know. Who did you play for in NFL Europe? Frankfurt Galaxy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What's the popularity of uh, football like? Uh, the only teams, the, 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 the teams that draw are Germany. And I think it's just they go out there and they have the beer garden, they drink so much, they just get fired up. I don't yeah. think they understand it, but they're doing soccer chants. There's like 50,000. Uh, Frankfurt, I think the teams ended up in Frankfurt, Rhine and Dusseldorf. You know, the other, uh, the other countries, football to them is soccer. It's not, yeah. you know, that, 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 and a lot of them don't even understand American football because soccer has been around for forever and, and they take that stuff serious, man. You know, those people end up wanting to have riots and fights in towns that really, you know, they, they don't like each other. Speaking of fights, I read that you were in a couple of fights when you were in the CFL, is that true? Yeah, well, I mean, I was always real passionate. Uh, it, it was bad because it wasn't, it wasn't, good to lose your control, get penalties and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I, coming out of martial arts, I had a, was raised with a, to have a fighting spirit and you should always control that, play within the rules and don't try to be dirty, which I never was. But uh, actually in New Orleans, when I went to the Saints after being cut from the Redskins, I swore that when I went there, I would not go out there with my tail between my legs. I would go out there and leave my mark, whether I made a team or not. And I, I started the first fight in camp, you know, just to let people know. I mean, and I had I got in a fight with Ronaldo Turnbull, who made the Pro Bowl that year, and all the local media was wanting to see me make the practice squad, you know. So I, I started fighting there, actually. And even in college, but in the CFL, I got kicked out a couple of games actually, and it cost me fines and stuff. But the fans loved it, you know, because yeah. they'd be on the jumbotron and they'd be chanting "high and right," you know. So uh, it was it was good and bad, you know. What were the uh, groupies like for you in football? Is there some pretty crazy stories out there? Well, yeah, them? yeah. I mean, they had, I guess every group of groupies has the names, you know. Uh, I think that maybe cleat chases might have been used, you know, but I always had girlfriends, man. I was never into that deal. Uh, but uh, yeah, they always have girls that like a rock and roll star or a wrestler or a, a, an actor or a football player, just depending on whatever, uh, where, wherever they fall into that category. And there's always guys that are willing to give them attention, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> and how did you end up getting into pro wrestling and football? Um, actually, uh, well, I mean, Goldberg was a big influence because I played with him. But actually, when I was in Shreveport, one night after a game, WCW was in town and I met Buff Bagwell at a bar. I was drinking, it was after the end, so I was having fun. We got to talking and we were like hanging out, shooting the breeze. And he told me that you, you, like, you're a big dude and you have a lot of character, you're nuts. So he recommended I maybe try it. And I had always uh, liked wrestling and then uh, the Rock was, there's a lot of wrestlers with football backgrounds, you know, so I started contemplating it when like 97 I got out of NFL Europe and I went back to Arena Ball in 98 in Portland and I was really beat up, not making much money and I was in New Orleans bouncing actually at the time trying to get re-signed with the Saints because it was right there and nothing was working out. They were like, you're too old, you're 28, 29, you've been out of the league three years, you know, we'll go, we're gonna go get a young kid out of college for free agent. Yeah. So the door kind of closed and uh, I actually saw a program on, I don't know if, it wasn't a learning channel because they did a documentary on me, but it was another channel that had a documentary and I think Cena was in it and it was of UPW in California. Oh, okay. I think and, I've seen that documentary. Yeah, it's and that there. sparked my interest. And an attorney buddy of mine who's an Italian guy who had the money to fly us out there to go meet UPW for a weekend. I went out there and met him. 
and really liked the guys out there. And, you know, I ended up moving out there. Uh, I, I planned for a couple months, saved up like 1500 bucks, loaded up my car and moved to California to go to school. That's how it all, you know, ended up happening. Like, it had always been there in the back of my mind, being in martial arts and football. And, uh, you know, with Goldberg as a friend, and he, by then he was God, you know? I mean, WCW and WWF, that was the Monday, that was the hottest time in the 90s, right? Man, it was like, so seeing him, that definitely, you know, water the seeds that were in my head of thinking about it. But I went to, uh, I went to California with my road, I loaded up my rodeo, 1500 bucks. My dad didn't want me to go because he's like, don't wrestle, you know, it's like, you need to go coach football or, you know, get into something you know. But I was like, no, I'm gonna do it. And uh, I had a girlfriend that loaned me some money also. She supported me and then, uh, I ended up moving out there and, and uh, stayed with one of the guys at UPW, Big Schwag, who was an announcer, actor guy. And uh, I had an apartment come open. It was, a, a, it was, I call it Gilligan's Island. It was an old hotel with the pool in the middle and the upstairs, downstairs in oh, Studio okay. City. And believe it or not, it was 600 bucks a, a month for an efficiency, basically, uh, basically like this hotel room. Yeah. But uh, one of the guys that lived there was an older guy, ended up passing away and uh, I had that come open. So I moved in there, put down money on that. I said, no electricity for a little while, no furniture, but I slept on the floor. But the first day I got to LA, I got bouncing jobs on Sunset, so I had income. I just had to save up a little money to buy rental furniture, electricity, and then pay for school, you know? But that's how that all started working. And I was bouncing, uh, paying for school, and then Bruce Pritchard came down, uh, uh, Dr. Tom would come down, JR, Paul Bearer. Because there was a deal with UPW. Yeah, yeah, UPW right? was developmental at the time. Okay. Yeah, it was like an entry level. So it was like, you know, single A baseball, you know? Because John Cena would have Yeah, been Cena there. was there, a ton of people, man. Did you get along with John at that Oh, point? yeah, yeah. He was a prototype. Could you tell that uh, he was going to be a big star? Well, man, when I went to visit that weekend, I, I walked into the school and he was in the ring, and I was like, man, this dude looks like the Terminator in the ring. Because back then he was bigger than he is now, believe it or not, because he yeah. was a college ball player and bodybuilder working at Gold's Gym and wrestling. But John's a genetic freak, number one. You know, some people are gifted with size. This guy, guy just has a freaky amount of muscle. You know, it's just, that's just, you know, some people God touches and say, you're going to be a cancer doctor, you're going to be a wrestler, you're going to be Heidenreich, you know. But he was one of the first guys I saw. And uh, you could just tell that guy, had you know everything yeah. and uh i was out there with him probably a year i got signed pretty quick you know because i was a big guy and i worked hard they told me they said just drop weight because i was like 310 from football so i got down to like 247 or 250 i got ripped because i was going to the gym and the bodybuilders were all like trying to help me they told me how to eat once you change your diet and do it you can get lean it's just a matter of doing it uh, what are some of the tricks for anyone watching that wants to lose some weight? Oh, diet? Yeah. Well, from uh, getting lean. Well, yeah. Well, well, first of all, anything, everything's on the internet if yeah. you want to find it. But I mean, number one, you gotta, you can't be taking in more calories than you're burning because if you do that, your body's gonna store fat. Number one. So you gotta, you know, understand how much, you know, figure out what you're doing each day and how many calories you're burning as to what you're eating, and then it's what you eat. You know, eating the right carbohydrates most people have the pyramid all screwed up there's too many carbs and they're not like vegetables sweet potatoes the brown rice and the brown bread even though bread should be restricted you know carbs you want to find out how many carbs you need to function with because your body likes fats number one carbs second so if you restrict your carbs the the fat that's stored in your body your body goes to that it's that's a uh, that's getting in ketosis. You can get pea sticks at the pharmacy, and then you, if you can restrict your carbohydrate intake, you can find out when you're in ketosis. And once you're in ketosis, if you have 30 pounds of body fat, or 40 or 50, well, you can drop that in, in a ridiculously quick amount of time because your body takes the fat that's stored on you and it uses that for energy, which it needs to run. So that's what I did, and those guys just helped me. And it basically just, the good carbs are all the vegetables, you know, 
sweet potatoes, yams, no, no, uh, no white bread, not too much bread. Stay away from a lot of dairy, you know, uh, and eat lean, lean protein. I mean, fish is the best. And then how you prep it, prepare it. I mean, you know, bake it to cook it clean. You know, you don't want to put gravy or butter all over it. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty simple. But yeah, that that helped me drop quick. Because when you lose body fat, all the muscles that are there, you see, and it, it, it just creates the illusion of, oh my God, all the muscles are there. But you know, when you get under 10%, that's when everything starts showing and you're like, oh my God, but that was all there, it was just covered. And then as you develop more muscle by eating more protein, you know, that's when the freakiness comes. But yeah, I dropped the weight and they signed me to the developmental and that helped out a ton. It was 500 bucks a week which means I didn't have to bounce for a couple of days instead of bouncing every day, you know? Yeah. Um, Cause they you did that. Stay in LA at that time. Yeah, yeah, you? yeah. Well, they, they did that for guys that look like that may be potentially guys that may make them some money. It was just an investment, you know? Yeah. Uh, I started there and then back then. Uh, Before you leave there, yeah. Nathan Jones was also there that time. Yes, yeah, there were stories about him. Was he oh man. To Crazy. <laughs> Nathan is, well, first and foremost, is a tremendously awesome, wonderful person. I mean, uh, there's nothing uh, evil in him or anything bad. Yeah. He's just so big and strong. I mean, I've been, I was in the NFL, which is some of the biggest, strongest guys in the world. He came out of the world strongman, you know, and he's yeah. also 6'10. And uh, I mean, I've never seen anybody lift that amount of weight with that type of height, you know. I mean, just insane. I mean, you know, he could throw me across the ring and I was, right. you know, it made me feel like a small person. But no, he was tremendous. Uh, we were a tag team, you know, down the line, you know, but uh, Nathan, uh, he's, he's one, there's only one Nathan Jones on the planet, you know, but uh, nothing but good stories about Nathan. Uh, and like Cena was there, Victoria. Uh, there's other, there's a, there's a ton of guys that ended up getting signed and being good really good wrestlers you know was it Samoa Joe even Samoa before? Joe was there training me uh Chris Daniels the prophet remember yeah. him yeah, he yeah, was yeah. training us um I'm getting forgetful right. of my old age but I mean there was a ton of guys there that were phenomenal uh Smelly was a developmental guy who yeah, brother, was, yeah Mad yeah. Dog's brother who yeah. passed away and then Chris Bell was the other brother who was a writer for WWE. He ended up doing the documentaries, Bigger, Faster, Stronger. Yeah. And then uh, another one about the prescription drug companies. It's a whole family. It's the Bell, the Bell boys, yeah, you know? Yeah. They're great. Uh, but yeah, it was, man, UPW in Huntington Beach was awesome. It was in a, it was in a, like a UFC dojo. Yeah. We just used the ring. With, they had a ring that had a spring in it. They pulled that pin out and it allowed you to bump, you know? Yeah. But it was like a 15, 16 foot vinyl ring, nothing yeah. fancy. The gym was mostly all the shoot fighting bags, you know, all those yeah. bags and mats for all that grappling. And they had another school in El Segundo that was basically an MMA dojo that they let us use wrestling. But uh, was yeah. it Rick Bassman right? Yeah, there? Rick. Rick was the owner of that. And uh, what are, what was he like? He, he was cool. Well, he helped. Yeah, he started a lot of people's careers. You know, uh, I think he has background with Disney. Uh, entertainment business because see what he did with the wrestlers he had a, an agency which was a talent agency and he used all those big guys for all the roles that come up in Hollywood which they always need big guys for bad guys bouncers you know whatever they're not a-list guys but you can make a living getting good money if and if you can do wrestling which is basically stunts you know how to do things without hurting somebody that's even making yourself more chance to make a living if you don't make it in wrestling so they eventually called you up to Ohio Valley Wrestling? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think how that went down. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think they, I'm trying to think, how, I think they told me I was going to be moved and I had a month to get there, you know, which is like going up to Double A or Triple A, probably Triple A, because OVW was going to TV, because back then they actually had Puerto Rico too, I believe. They'd say yeah, IWA was, yeah, uh, yeah. Had they had like three different places. That's yeah. why I always said it was like Double A, Single A, and triple a minor league baseball you know that's what it was like which is good man to get guys to get better and you know not just having guys off the street trying to get them to go jump in the ring in front of ten thousand people in arenas you know not smart so they had a way to funnel you in and prepare you was it bruce pritchard that you were dealing with for talent yeah question? bruce came in mostly in california and uh, jr and uh, paul bearer came to watch me and nathan's we were a tag team we, we were the ultimate army right. <laughs> me and him and we wore camouflage army pants and uh 
Our first tag team match with the Ballard Brothers, who were guys who were the hockey gimmicks. I believe they're from Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah we worked them, and uh, I've seen the video of it because uh, there was a news story on you or something. Yeah, the, the Learning yeah. Channel. Yeah, the did Learning the body Channel. slam, making it a pro wrestler. They had yeah. me and four or five other people in the uh, uh, UPW system. It was really awesome. But yeah. Did you ever uh, have any reconciliation with that girl that apparently uh, you broke up with during that? Brandy, time? she's st yeah, she's my best friend still. Oh, yeah. Still, yeah, yeah, it was just a hard time. Her sister had uh, passed away with some type of brain hemorrhage thing out of the blue, you know, and uh, which is they were they were like best friends, not only sisters, and that was rough for her. And I was gone, and uh, you know. It was, it was hard cool at the time. They covered all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what was going on? It wasn't staged, you know. Yeah. They wanted real stuff, and I didn't mind, you know. I wasn't. It wasn't drama. We didn't make anything up, you know. Yeah. It was the stuff I was going through. She wasn't evil or anything. People break up all the time, you know. That happens. So for whatever reason, they decided to call you up shortly after that first match, then. Uh, it wasn't long, man. Yeah. I, I I wasn't out there about a year, man, at the most, yeah. and uh. I mean, I liked it out there because I had gotten some uh, work with Rick getting me on auditions mm -hmm. for yeah. commercials and uh, some, I fought Test and the 18 Wheels of Justice was a television show uh, where G. Gordon Liddy was in that. And they, cool. were, they, they, they were like a police thing that rode around in the big uh, 18 wheeler, but it was a surveillance deal, you know? And I, it was an underground fighting, uh, illegal underground fighting episode. And I fought Test and I got poisoned and killed, you know? I did a great dead guy. He said, no one ever stayed that still. But um bumps it was a joke. <laughs> Laugh. I had this, <laughs> they're like, you're not funny. <laughs> oh, okay, so, my bad. So what was it like when you switched to OVW? Man, I tell you what, first week or two, I felt like I didn't know anything and I felt like awkward, like, Cause right there was like Randy Orton's, uh, you know, Nick Densmore. I mean, it was all guys that were really polished guys uh, that had been wrestling five, ten years, and uh, and I was a big guy, kind of crazy. So all of them were kind of lyrics. They didn't know if I was gonna hurt them. They're always worried about it for guys polished, and then because it's a lot of control involved in wrestling. If not, you can really injure somebody. So I had a rocky start. But, uh, it was more political, I guess, there than uh, UPW. Yeah, because there was a lot more guys that were, you know, like Orton, guys that had families, you know, dads and family tradition, and guys that they had invested a lot more money in and were probably getting ready to go to television. And then they also had the uh, Cincinnati school where Les Thatcher ran. Yeah, that was Heartland another, wrestling yeah, or something. Yeah, because like, uh, the Samoan boys were there, Matt and Eki, uh, yeah. and the Haas brothers. Uh, a lot of good talent, and that we'd worked some in, in between. So those guys were really far ahead of me in experience, you know. Uh, I had been doing wrestling about a year. But Jim Cornette and Danny Davis were really awesome to me, and Dr. Tom Pritchard was there a lot, and all of them treated me like family. And we had a lot of guys from WWE come in that had maybe injured or not working on TV that they were paying, so they'd send them down almost to help us train, you know. Yeah. So I learned a lot. Big Boss Man trained me, and I always had a real, uh, a, lot, a lot of respect and affection for him because he was so nice to me. That's why I used to use a spinning bubble slam as a finish. Yeah. I never had much of a finish because I really didn't do a lot of matches that I won. I was always just getting beating people up and going crazy, you know, at WWE. Yeah. But I, I Boss Man was really cool. I, I tagged with Bull Buchanan and OVW. I mean, I worked with all kind of guys that were like, you know, already established guys on TV where I learned a lot, you know. Do you have any particular story about Jim Cornette that... Uh... Oh man, there's a bunch. Uh, yeah, I could tell some of them, they're not too bad. Yeah. Uh, the first time I worked on Ohio Valley Wrestling Television, that, that TV was uh, actually well, it had like good ratings. It was watched a lot in that area. It was on the WB Network. It would air on Saturday nights, we'd tape on Wednesdays. I had to, I was Big Bad John, and I was like an enforcer for a group of heels. And I had to do, a, I did a run-in where I was going to beat somebody up. And basically they'd already been beat up by people in my group but I was just supposed to just lay it on them yeah and I guess you know I was nervous it might have been my first time on TV and uh 
Jim, you know, that, that building, the original OVW training center was like in a hundred year old building, you know, literally it was like much, not much bigger than this room, Yeah. but that was like a lot of tradition. But he asked me to come out in the back of the building and uh, his car was there. And he's like, when you run out there to do a beat down on somebody, you know, and he was mad at me, but he was passionate, you know. He says, you gotta really let, and like, you gotta make it look real. And he started kicking his car, like, with his shoes, like, in the front, all the yeah. bumper and plastic. You know, he's like, and you, know, and you gotta make it look real, especially as big as you are. You know, if you do anything that looks bad or not believable, it's over-amplified because you're already big, you know. So he, he went off on me that way, but it was, it was love, you know. So he's uh, damaging his own car, he was so passionate. Yeah, yeah. Cornette would tear up a lot of stuff. He, I mean, he lives and breathes wrestling, and you gotta respect that man. You know, he's always been really good to me, and I think he's developed so many good people. And I mean, he loves what he does, and he's passionate, and you can't, you can't fault somebody for that. Was Brock Lesnar in OVW around that time? Yes, too? yes, he was. Him and Shelton were the Minnesota stretch, stretch crew. Yeah. Because they were both collegiate guys. Yeah. From Minnesota, and uh, yeah, I, I worked with him one time, and I always tell the story. He did me a belly back, belly to back suplex, which I've taken before, but I've never had somebody actually just pick me up, you know, literally, and like hold me. It felt like a roller coaster, you know, when you're at the top one, click, 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 click. He, when he, he hooked me and went up, it was like, it felt slow motion, like that's how strong he was. It was like click, 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 and then like I pause right there when he had me up. I'm like, oh God, I think I'm about to break my neck or my back. And it was a perfect bump, because I mean, he laid me down flat. But I never had been picked up like that, being a big guy. Yeah. That's just, you know, he's a freak, like Cena in his own way, but even bigger and, and more genetically gifted and uh, just, you know, there's a, you know, he's a monster, you know? How yeah. was he outside the ring? I wasn't as close with him, because uh, he was a way ahead of me, you know? Right. Uh, he was head of the ring crew at that time. He was kind of like the alpha male of OBW, you know? Yeah. Uh, but no, he was never rude or mean to me. Uh, he was more like outdoorsman hunting guy and stuff, which I'm from the city, so I'm not a big hunter. I mean, I'm an animal lover. I got cats and dogs, so. But uh, I mean, I didn't have any heat or anything with him. He was just, you know, he was getting ready. I mean, everybody knew he was gonna be a, a, a big impact in WWE, you know, because yeah. he just, he had all the tools, you know, the skill set, you know college wrestler and and that background and that look you know so yeah was batista around too dave was there too and yeah. that's another freak that's another guy that's like where did he come from what planet like superman or something yeah he was leviathan demon of the deep uh i never wrestled him because he was a heel you know yeah but uh yeah um were you friends with him at all dave was we actually were, were pretty friendly we used to ride sometimes at the shows because we did house shows and all and i knew his wife and uh he had daughters from a previous marriage, so yeah, I used to do stuff with him. They used to train at the same gym. So Dave, Dave's a lot more mild man and a laid back guy out of the ring, you know? Brock's a lot more intense, but I think that's, you know, his background in, in probably wrestling. I heard Dave did get in a fight once in, OV, in OVW though, didn't he? Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't, is, is that the Booker T deal? No, it was uh, something else. I know I heard about the Booker T deal. Yeah. I uh, forget the guy's name. The guy died since they got in the fight with Oh, him. really? Wow. Was, yeah, it was, uh, I may, it was a long time ago. I don't know. If, it may have been before me, you know? Yeah. But Dave was always really mild-mannered to me, you know? Yeah. Uh, he seemed like a nice guy. Yeah, he yeah. He was, really he was well very laid back, you know? Uh, and so when did you actually get called up to WWE? You were part of, obviously, probably one of the best yeah. uh, OVW classes of all time. Man, I had, like I said, that place was loaded back yeah. then. It was all first rounders. Uh, I actually, uh, see, I was, I think I was, I think it might have been 2002 or three, maybe, in OVW after the 2000 and 2001 in California. I actually was uh, moving along and progressing and they, 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 you would get a call and say, hey, we're gonna put you on the roads to allow you to do house shows yeah. and maybe darks, which means you didn't have a character actually was gonna be introduced on television, but they were kind of seeing where you were. And uh, we were actually practicing at the old arena one day, practicing monkey flips, oh my God. 
and I've never taken one or given <laughs> one. But everybody had to, you know, you had these drills you had to do to yeah. learn. And uh, they're not made for people yourselves. <laughs> and Sean O'Hare was giving me the monkey flip, another big guy. Yeah. And uh, I was taking it, and I wasn't going to say no. I won't want to try it, or I want to really understand the concept of the move, which he should always do. Because every time I tried a move that I never done and didn't say anything, I ended up getting hurt or near disaster. But he ended up. Uh, flipping me over and kind of bumped and didn't roll, didn't really help me get all the way over, so I ended up landing on the shoulder, separated my shoulder. Had four operations and got released. So that was actually the first time I was going to be put on TV. That was probably 02 maybe. So you were actually released from the Yeah, company. I was released and then I went to J Japan, zero one for probably six or eight months doing tours every month or two. Because uh, had you contact yeah, yeah. And uh What was that like in Japan? Just uh, it's, it's a different world, brother. Uh, Japanese is, to, to me, it's full contact. There's not much work there. And uh, I don't understand, there's a little different style or a different formula. You don't sell as much, especially a big guy. They're like, no sell, you just, you know, I get mad. I'm like, what's the point of being some guy beating me up and if I don't act like it hurts, when it does hurt, <laughs> you yeah. know? Is it just a different style? Japan's different. Uh, it's a lot more violent and, uh, the Japanese wrestling is more like straight sport, you know, it's still reported on the newspapers like it's real. There's, the the kayfabe is still kayfabe and uh, I mean, I, it was a learning experience. Uh, me and Nathan tagged over there also. We won the NWA International Tag Belts for a little while, but uh, I got to wrestle against Hashimoto and Ogawa who were awesome, Otai and Tanaka. But uh, I mean, Japan's a long flight and the food's weird and it's just a different, it's a different world, you know. So I did, that wasn't my favorite place to go and wrestle, but it, it was a learning experience. And then they re-signed me because I was doing really well over there. And uh, Were you living in a dojo there or something? No, no, we'd go over two or three weeks at a time. Yeah, zero one and, and just do, uh, you know, four, six, eight, ten shows or whatever and then come back, you know. So yeah. uh, they called you up, I guess? Yeah, they, well, they, yeah, they said, you know, don't sign anything along with them. They said, we're going to bring you back. So I was like, well, that's awesome because I don't want to be in Japan, you know? And uh, How was the money for Zero One? It was good, yeah. I mean, for a guy that really never had any WWE TV, I was making, you know, a few thousand a tour, which is a lot of money. And because overseas tours, you don't incur hardly any cost, you know? They fly yeah. you there, they drive you, they feed you, or they give you per diem, you know? So yeah, I actually end up spending little or no money if you're really smart. Um, just don't get carried away with phone calls, you know? Yeah. Back then they didn't have these international plans. Because one tour, I thought I had an international rate and I ran up. Whatever I made that tour, I spent on my phone bill. I was like, okay, that's really smart. And that but, was before you could get internet on your phone too. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. But so yeah. Um, they gave you that gimmick when you first came, I guess, with uh, the doll or something? Yeah, well, Little Johnny Little was Johnny. on Raw. Yeah, I started with Stone Cold. And that was actually my idea, because I'm a writer. I've been writing since college, poetry and stories, lyrics and poems, and just kind of, I was an artist as a kid. I liked drawing and building models. So as part of my creative side, I just said I always got so big in the in sports. I used to play guitar. Who would you have talked to about that idea? Little Johnny? Yeah. Well, I presented it to him and we started doing it. I okay. I send in all I was sending in all my ideas through Chris Bell into the creative, you know. Oh, okay. Because I don't want somebody writing something for me. I'd rather present something that's really in me. I had a lot of ideas I shot in. Um, but the little Johnny, I was teased as a child. This is a real, you know, being a big kid, I was teased heavily first through sixth grade and seventh, first to, to middle school, the eighth grade. Went to high school where I kind of grew out of the baby fat, insecure, self esteem bad guy. And I got teased a lot in the seventh and eighth grade by these three guys. And I, one day after school, they were messing with me. I was waiting for my dad to pick me up. And I just kind of snapped on them and beat them up. Well, little Johnny was like the, that was my inner child that had been made to feel ugly for so much of my life, which I felt a lot of kids could relate, or people, whether whatever. So little Johnny, I had a doll that I would talk to, you know, because he would tell me to go get people, and, and I was going to make him pay for making me feel ugly and fat and whatnot, fatty, fatty, two by four. This is all real stuff I use yeah. in that story, which, uh, they just never really let it materialize because uh, we did the little Johnny thing for a while and he's getting over because everybody would ask who is, what is little Johnny. They kind of went uh, around a, a 
Vince and WWE always does kind of the dirty deal with it. So, uh, working with Stone Cold, who was the one that told you you'd be doing that character with Stone Cold? Let me think. Uh, well, they, they put me on the road and I was, I was traveling with uh, uh, Renee, Rob Conway, Garrison, Cade on Raw and doing uh, house shows. Renee and, Dupree? Yeah, yeah, and dark matches. And uh, I'm trying to remember how they presented that, man. It was in Chicago. Stone Cold had gotten kicked out of the arena. I think Bischoff had put him out the building. And I was standing outside and, uh, excuse me, the gist was like, I went up to talk to him as a starstruck fan, you know? Yeah. And I was like, Stone Cold, I mean, I, I, my dream is to try to make it in wrestling, you know? And I was like, I bought a ticket to come to the show tonight. He's like, oh, you have a ticket? He's like, he's like, come over here, let me talk to you. So basically, he sweet-talked me and getting my ticket to get back in. And uh, the next week, I don't actually remember who gave the idea. Uh, Were you sure. excited? Because he, oh, yeah. he was just Stone coming off his big run. Yeah, man. Well, Stone Cold's one of my favorites, and that was raw. So it's live, man. It's like, you know, stress, bro. You know, like, okay, we're going live. Don't screw this up. And the next week, we did another back deal, backstage deal where I gave him the tape to try to look at a petition for a chance, you know. And then I think the following week, I got my trial match, I think from him or the general manager with uh, Hurricane against La Resistance. And it was in a military town, like, I forget where it was, where they have an army base, it was all military around. And it was cool because La Resistance was hated, you know? Yeah. And we beat them up and I, uh, I went and got the American flag, you know, and everybody was happy. So it was awesome debut, you know? Uh, with the Hayden, uh, you know, that, that was John Heidenreich actually. Yeah. I didn't have any intro music. I had some generic stuff that Paul Heyman's like, that's terrible, we gotta change that. And they made that Heidenreich song, which was killer, but I- uh, Heyman was a writer back then? Yeah, yeah, well, when I went to SmackDown, he was like, when we when they reinvented me, he was yeah. like, we're gonna get rid of this old John Heidenreich thing, you know, we're gonna- So what happened, like, with that, first of all, you had yeah, this yeah. gimmick and- well, Yeah, I, I wrestled them, and I I actually did a mixed tag with me and Trish against Victoria and Steve Richards, that, that match went well, that was on Raw, and we won, and then, uh, I'm trying to think, I did several things with Hurricane, yeah. You know, backstage, things that were funny. Like they were going to push you. Yeah, Hurricane with Rosie. Remember, he was the reporter guy, yeah. you know? Because he was a superhero in training, which we won't say what it stands for, but... Yeah. <laughs> right? But, uh, yeah, and... Uh, actually, what happened, I, I actually injured... I actually remember I injured my quad. I, ha I got a hematoma, and this sounds crazy, because normally it's a thigh bruise from, like, something hitting you. A pretty violent impact, which forms it can be really bad, you know? Yeah. I actually went, uh, I was in a match with Hurricane. I think maybe, yeah, and, or something. And I, I went to go over the top rope and my leg just, as I went over, I got like stuck and didn't go completely. I, and I just rolled down the rope on my thigh. And believe it or not, that force of that rope ended up, by the end of that show that night, I couldn't walk, my leg is full. I thought I had broke my leg, it hurts so bad. And so people that don't know, it hurts even just hitting the ropes. Oh yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. you gotta develop all your body parts to take that impact, you know? That was just an uh, this example of when you hit that rope wrong, it, it basically gave me like a hematoma like you get in football from a guy hitting you with his helmet. Yeah. Because I had to, I mean, that's what ended my push right there because I couldn't walk. I had to go to the therapy at Tulane Rehab, uh, Tulane University. And that was like four weeks. I couldn't walk for like two weeks. You know, my legs swole. They took exercise because yeah. it wasn't broken, but I was unable to wrestle. I couldn't bend my leg. So that, man, I was very frustrated. So I was like, oh my God, I hope they don't fire me. You know, I don't want to be gone very long because it's just not good in wrestling to be getting paid yeah. and not being pr productive. But anyway, that, that ended that little Johnny thing. Cause I mean, I had done a lot of vignettes, like stuff with uh, Trish Stratus where she, when I mean, Jericho and her were doing a deal where she's like, oh, don't worry about He's like, yeah, Heidenreich's crazy, man. You shouldn't trust that guy. He's like, oh, don't worry about little Johnny. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, he showed me little Johnny, you know? Like, he's like, that's wonky, man. That guy, you know? So the, the, the thing was getting, uh, we were giving vignettes and in-ring stuff with that, but that injury was, with, you know, sidelined that. And then I was off for about a month, went back to OVW. And then the call came from SmackDown. It said, you're gonna be with Heyman, get red boots, red tights, and red gloves. And they wanted me to have short boots like Goldberg, you know? And, uh, 
you know, that wasn't long after that deal, several months, and then I did that gimmick, and I guess the rest is history, you know? Uh, How did you like working with Heyman on camera? Oh, I loved it. He was he was great back, I mean, off stage and in, and in ring and on camera. He was very helpful. The guy's got a lot of knowledge. You hear a lot of mixed things about Paul, but I mean, because you don't know somebody, so you only hear what other people say. Yeah. But meeting him, working with him, he was tremendous to me. He, he helped me. And I mean, the guys he's worked with are all great top guys, man. So yeah. I looked at it as an honor just to be with him, you know? And, uh, what was the best advice he gave you that you can remember? <laughs> uh, the, uh, well, I guess I can say that. The first match that I interfered was the JBL Undertaker hearse match. Yeah. Uh, I was in the casket waiting to jump the Undertaker. Yeah. Uh, I was in there waiting. He goes, John, you know, get ready, man. Your point's coming. But he goes, get ready because you're about to be swimming with the sharks. Yeah. Meaning, you know, wrestling is a cutthroat business. It's very competitive, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, uh, just basically, you know, hey, you know, you got to look at it as a very competitive business, which is going to promote people to do any and everything to make it because the stakes are high, which was, you know, that's good advice, man. You're not, you're not being negative. You're just being honest, man. You know, you just, you know, and uh, he had a lot of advice like that, you know. He always told me, man, he's like, no one knows if you're really crazy or not, but a lot of people think you're really hard, and he's like, just keep going with that, because <laughs> that's good, because if they don't know really if you're nuts or not, they kind of keep their distance in that way. They don't, if, if guys know you too much, sometimes it's bad, because, you know, they'll be friends, and you'll think they're your friend, and maybe they have a motive, well, they think, maybe I could get his spot or whatnot, you know, unfortunately, it's it's not it's all fair. But yeah, it's not all true. fair, you know, life's not fair, and not everybody's, out to see everybody else do well. So that he was very good with that. Because I came out of football, and football, it was a camaraderie. You would never think of doing anything to a fellow offensive lineman other than help him, or anybody on your team. I mean, if a guy beats you out, I mean, he was better than you, you know? Yeah. And wrestling is a lot of, uh, you know, it's jealousy because, man, you're becoming a star, you know? Yeah. And a lot of guys have put in more time than some guys and you get a break for whatever reason and hey yeah it's understandable guys like man I should have that spot I mean uh, I used, I had guys make me feel bad and I'd go talk to fit and all that like they're just doing that because they've been here longer and you know just understand them and don't react to it you know it's 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 just part of you know a competitive alpha male type of deal you know were you excited when you first found out you're going to be feuding with the Undertaker? Oh man, yeah, I was more than that. Yeah, I was like speechless and just, I mean, nervous, excited, and everything, man. But uh, he's such a tremendous wrestler in person. You know, it was like a blessing being with him. I mean, he's the ultimate professional. You know, I mean, if you can't go in there and wrestle with him and do well, there's something wrong with you. Because I mean, he's the best, and the best guys take a new guy who has talent and the right attitude and they can like mold you, you know, in ring. Cause you can't learn by doing drills. You learn, but the, the, it's like, you know, on the job training in the ring in front of 10,000 when the stakes are high, that's how you learn that you have a good or a great or one of the best teachers like that to, to help you hold your hand. Even though they're beating you up, they're still holding your hand. Cause that's, that's the art of the business. Two guys working together to compete. We're not competing in points but we're competing at a high level to entertain people to suspend the disbelief that this is not real. You know, like when you go to a movie and you see the Matrix, well, you know they're not flying around, but that movie takes you away. That's what we do as wrestlers, you know? That's, that's the beauty in the art. When you get in there with Undertaker, and Goldberg said this, we, sus we suspend, you know, the disbelief that, well, this is fake. But if you can go to a match and be like, in the match, you're like, man, this is real, you know? That's where the magic is, and that's how people come. And that's what The Undertaker did for me. And a lot of guys did, you know. They fit Finley, and they all taught me. And I mean, it was, it's, it's still, I still can't believe that I worked The Undertaker. That's yeah. how it is, man. And I think the world of him, I mean, he's this amazing person. And to be doing it as long as he has, I don't see how he still walks. Because my, I was in it 12 or 13, 14 years, and from what I did to myself in football, right now, at almost 48, I have serious health issues, man. I'm beat up. Some days I can't walk without a cane in my left knee, you know, and you know, they pay a price. Any athlete that goes professional in any sport, you're sacrificing, you know, so 
I guess I get kind of carried away with the Undertaker thing because I'm really fired up about working him. Yeah. It was, I mean. You what know. did you think of that casket match you had at the Royal Rumble with him? Oh, it was great. It was cool because I, I actually had a, like a, a, a deep-seated inner fear for caskets and it, it, it comes out of something horrific that happened to me, but it, it was something that I drew off of that made it real. My brother was murdered when I was in high school and uh, that's what my fear of caskets really came from. And I told Stephanie and them, I said, I don't know if this is too morbid or too far to go, but this is really where it comes from. That's why I draw into that. Like, I hate caskets because I think of seeing, you know, my brother and that. And that, that was, I mean, I think that's what made it so believable because it came from somewhere real. And uh, I mean... Was it a random murder or was it... Uh, well, my brother wasn't doing the smartest and best things drug-wise. And the people you befriend in that world aren't always your friends because they're not functioning with an optimal level brain, you know, when you, he was involved with heroin and stuff. And, yeah. uh, you know, it was a tragedy, man. But I mean, you know, that's where that, the fear of caskets come from. And I mean, any, and it's like, what would you, I think anybody has a fear of a casket to be put in one before you're dead. I mean, if you're dead, it's okay. You know, unless you want to be cremated, but you know, uh, I never, I, I'm claustrophobic, number one. There's no room in the casket. And they used to mess with me because we did the casket matches at some house shows and overseas to work on it before we did it. And it always, I'd put a bottle of water in there to try to have because I'd be blowed up from wrestling. Yeah. And uh, they'd take it out and then they'd sit on the thing when they roll it back in the back and not let me out. And I'd be like, you know, if you're claustrophobic, that's like, you're like flipping out. Yeah. But it was just ribbing, you know? But uh, <laughs> but it wasn't to me when I'm in the casket, yeah. you know, because there's not a lot of room. It wasn't like some of the caskets they had, some of his matches were bigger and more elaborate. And on yeah, eight, like mine was just like the, the, you know, the dang generic version, <laughs> metal. Wow. And is it true at one point that uh, they were thinking of having you and Snitsky team up against him? Yeah, I don't know if it's for sure, but we worked, me and Snitsky worked uh, Kane and The Undertaker at the Hawaii house show in Alaska, house yeah. shows. And I thought it went, I mean, it seemed magic to me because me and Schnitzky, I thought we had like a cool chemistry because he's nuts, you know, not my fault and I'm writing poems and he's like telling me it's gonna be okay, John, you know, like two monster guys sitting there almost like two big children, you know. And, uh, you know, like at the Rumble, he, he came out, you know, you know he came out to beat down the Undertaker and then Kane came up and cleared it out and I ended up losing, but I would have hoped, I, I never got to work WrestleMania. I did the Battle Royal, but I wanted to work the Undertaker. That would have been the culmination of almost a whole year of two, you know, Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, then I interfered in two of the championship matches with Taker. And that would have been like, man, you know, I, I was disappointed, needless to say, but that's their choice. But I think that would have been cool if we, you know, me and, Schnitzky, we could have gone, I think, down the line and done a bunch of stuff, kind of like Kane and The Undertaker, you know? But yeah, that that was a rumor, and uh, I think Randy started working The Undertaker at Mania at, in Los Angeles, and they yeah. worked like, a, which was, they had tremendous matches. I mean, Randy's phenomenal. He can do a lot of stuff that I can't, but he can't act crazy and write poems. No, I'm just joking. Randy's phenomenal, but yeah. I hope the uh, same size as the Undertaker or closer to the Undertaker size either you were like yeah 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 it, I mean, not say that that was a good feud no no well, well, I mean, everything I've heard from fans and and it's always been a lot of positive stuff the, the feud I had with the Undertaker and of course I love it because I was working him or wrestling him and uh, a lot of people said the things that happened in those matches the things he did was out of respect and admir you know, it was, he was wanting to help me because he saw somebody with potential. You can tell by the way a, a, a top guy like that sells and does things for you and that, that will make you, that will elevate you from here to here. You know, if you went out there and, and fought The Undertaker and you didn't beat him, but I mean, you pushed him like, you know, that, that automatically brings me to another level, which I, that's why I say I'm grateful for him. But I had so much fun with him, you know? I mean, I don't know, you, you want me to share one yeah, actual sure. match story with The Undertaker? Sure. Okay, cool, because I get carried away. I'm like, am I talking too much? No, people love uh, hearing about The yeah, Undertaker. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was Italy, house show, okay? With me and The Undertaker, and I'm nervous. And The Undertaker, uh, thank God I was trained at OVW where you learn how to work, you don't have to call everything out. 
because he told me when you're upside down it's over you okay kid basically that's what we had basically it's when you get the tombstone it's over that's all we talked about yeah. right which I was like, oh God, you know? Yeah. But hey, I'm like, I know he'll take care of me. And he'll, he's, he's that good. The match, the, the match starts out, we uh, do some chain wrestling. And I think I went to hit the rope to give him a tackle or something and the top rope broke. <laughs> so basically we can't wrestle like, you know, the stuff you normally do. If the top rope's broken, you're not, the match is gone uh, in your mind of what we were gonna do. And I just had the deer in the headlights. Look, I think he had fallen down. And he was like looking at me and I was like frozen. He's like, he's like, kick my ass, beat the hell out of me, you know? It's easy now. But that was like DEFCON 50s, whatever. To start the match nervous and have the rope break. You know, you know when a rope breaks, it's like ping, you know that sound. It's like, oh, F, you know, I don't want to cuss, but it's like, holy shit, what do we do now? But it was cool. We just we, we modified everything and, and had the match. But uh, and you yeah. wrestled them on tribute to the troops too. What's it like going to? Was it Afghanistan at that time? Yeah, that was a life changing experience, by far, man. I because uh, my father was military, wanted me to go to Air Force Academy, wanted me to follow that, but I was just too nervous and didn't want to. But you know, uh, and you know, wars are hor horrific. Any war that takes place is horrific. So many lives are killed and wasted. It's just a, it's a, it's a shame that humanity has to resort to that, but they have they do happen, and you have to. I don't care if you hate wars or against America or terrorism or what, but the people that go there, they are they are football players and actors and teachers or and football. I mean, I don't mean to put teachers, but they get a lot of notoriety and fame, but. I mean, a, a soldier gives the ultimate thing. He gives his life, you know? And going over there and meeting them and just being there for a few days, like, anytime I meet a military or policeman or fuck, I thank them, number one, and I'm like, you know, you're the ultimate hero, you know? So it was, that was like, it wasn't just a wrestling show, it was like a life-changing experience being there, you know? Uh, Cause it's dangerous everywhere over there, you know, the terrorism deal. Uh, so man, it was mind-blowing experience. It's dangerous, you know. Yeah. And uh, me and take a rest. And it also was like 30 degrees in the winter there. And in, in the uh, it was January, December. I'm like, and in the summer it's like 100 and something. I'm like, well, that's bad. Well, maybe that's why there's such a uneasiness here with temperature extremes like that. Maybe yeah. you know, it's, but it was crazy. But uh, and you wrestled outside too. Yeah, it was yeah. cold as heck. And uh, with no shirt. I was supposed to. I was supposed to bail out the ring and go nuts and run off the through the crowd and like you know, and uh, the, the soldiers wouldn't let me. They would not let me get out that ring. So I just it was a count out, you know. Yeah. But we had a good match, man. It was awesome. I mean, um, yeah. And just the troops, just the picture of all the soldiers and stuff. It was awesome. I felt like I did something to help support them and help them because you know they're over there away from their families and some of them don't make it home, you know. So it was cool. That's the USO is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And when was the decision made? I guess it wasn't too long after that that they decided to turn you face. Yeah. Um, I, I. They rushed all that to me. They could have had me be a heel and work so many more guys and get better. I worked uh, Booker T at a pay per view, which was fun. I got DQ, but working him, I learned. You know. Uh, I, and uh, I mean, yeah. The, I, I didn't get to do enough stuff after that because uh, yeah I remember the writers saying man you're getting over your character is so cool and fun and blah 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 and they said something like why wow, they were going to turn me baby and I was like it doesn't make any sense to me but you're the boss you know I was like I'm people are loving the heel thing you know I was getting over and popularity is for a heel in the heel way I was just loving that you know being psychotic and crazy and poems and Heyman but uh, yeah, they because not long after that I did the my friends thing, you know. Yeah, I remember in Hershey, Pennsylvania, I had that big chocolate bar and stuff. Yeah, you know, it was like funny. Goofy, with, yeah. How did the kids react when they had to do the stuff in the ring? Oh, they were cool. I mean, I know one of them was an actual actor, which which she was awesome, professional. But I mean, it was cool because kids are really that's a that's another amazing aspect of sports and wrestling. Kids, you know, it's like. 
it's their holy grail of entertainment and fun, you know, that at golden age for, a, I guess, a lot of boys, you know, from six to 10 or 12, you know, and they just, uh, it was cool. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, the poems and all that stuff. You wrote I'm, your own poems? Yeah, right? yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a nut. I'm, I mean, I was a, 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 an artist. My relatives built Mardi Gras floats, so I was in the art background as a child, you know, models, railroads, and I wanted to be, an, I wanted to be a, a musician or a special effects artist until I got so big. I loved Elvis, I played guitar, you know, all that stuff, but uh, that was just part of the create creativity that came out, you know, in the character, which made it cool and different. I mean, how many big psychos write poetry yeah. and want friends? How did you like your uh, feud with Orlando Jordan? It was okay. I, I think it, it, big, the big show said, man, they should have put the belt on you and made, brought some meaning to that, you know, because you were a baby, you were getting over. And he's like, you ought to go and tell him, hey, man, put the belt on me. But I didn't really feel comfortable doing that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and not knocking Orlando, because I mean, he's a really good worker. I worked yeah. with him in Europe, and I didn't actually know how good he was, so I watched some of his matches as a heel. And I mean, I'm not talking about anything to do with him personally, because you know, there's all type of rumors, but he's a, yeah. he's a heck of a wrestler, really athletic guy, not too big, you know, um, but I mean, really good worker. I just thought the few with me and him, they could have done more with. Not saying I had to win or he did, they just didn't, uh, we did that pay-per-view and only if you want to do a pay-per-view you want to do something with it to go somewhere you know because he there was always the rumor he was gay or something right and then he later did yeah gay yeah I mean hey yeah I mean that's hey, there's a lot of different background I mean entertain wrestling is entertainment sports yeah. mixed with showbiz so that's now that's they a, have openly gay people yeah and I'm not hey, I mean, it, it, as long as you're yeah. consenting and it's an adult I mean, <laughs> hey, that's your right to, yeah. to, to your I have no right to tell you how to live you know I'm not perfect, man. They say only God or whatever you believe. So, I mean, I I I know people that are gay or bi or, uh, and I mean, I have nothing against them. I mean, um, as long as they're a good person, you know. Uh, but yeah, he's a great worker. I just they didn't they, that angle just didn't do much for anybody. It was like we worked and did a pay per view and nothing. Um, did you have much contact with Chris Benoit when you were in WWE? I, uh, well, he came to OVW, we took him out for his birthday, you know, and uh, we had a really good time. And actually, I, uh, the, the first, I, I said, forget this, when I was married, I was raising a little boy, and I took Hayden to a, a house show in USL or a TV where I was going to maybe do a dark. Yeah. And Hayden was there, like six years old, and I, I didn't really want to bring him, but I, he was begging me to go. Cause I was new, and you know, you just don't want to bring kid, you know. And uh, Benoit saw I was new, and he didn't even know me, but he saw Hayden, got him in the ring, wrestled with him, gave him DVDs and T-shirts and everything. That made like for Hayden, he still talks. He's like twenty something now, but that was like phenomenal, you know. Uh, so I liked Chris a lot personally, and in the ring, I thought he was a tremendous worker. I don't know if we're going there with this question, but what? allegedly transpired that night with him, I do not believe that story. I, I wholeheartedly, and I'm not going to go into conspiracy theories, but I think something else happened that night, and I don't believe that he killed his son, or his wife, or himself. And uh, Maybe I'm crazy, but I knew him too well, you know? I don't know if you were going there, but I guess I can say well, that. Well, it, it is the, uh, it's the 10 year anniversary of that, actually, this yeah. year. So. I will never believe that. I don't know what happened, but what was presented to us, I just don't believe that, you know, and maybe I just, maybe I'm biased because I knew him, you know, and maybe something horrific happened that night, but I can't see him as kind and as gentle as he was with my son, and I knew him when his other son, little Benoit, would come around, and this child was, I think, handicapped. I can't see him hurting that, and or a woman, you know, and, 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 and Taking his Apparently own Apparently his child, uh, from what other people have said, that was just a rumor that the okay, media yeah. bring out. His, yeah. his child was not actually see, handicapped. See, I had no, I had never, just, I uh, only kn knew little Benoit, which is his other son, <laughs> yeah. and he came around the shows. You know, that's just my belief. Maybe I want to believe the best in everybody, but. So not to, I'm not getting into conspiracy theories, yeah. but you think that something else may have happened. I, mean, I work for WWE. I know the things that go on, you know, I mean, at any high level of any business, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of things that 
operate undercurrents and things that are going on that we always don't know about, but you find out working there. And, I, you know, I just, I, I have a story or a, an idea, a theory of what really happened. That, to me, fits what I believe. And I mean, well, you can tell us the story if you want. We'll I don't want to, really. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. No, 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 it's fine. It involves, you know, the WWE yeah. and uh, things with the government that has been, the government's been investigating Vince for years about mis, you know, way he treats employees and things that go on up there. Uh, letters were sent out to everybody at WWE after Benoit and Eddie, wanting people to give information if things were going on that were like not a proper work environment, you know, the way they treated, you know, things that, you know, those things that went on that were really uh, way far too stressful and too much pressure to put on somebody, you know, which makes them snap like that. Yeah, like we just the government yeah. sent those letters, or yeah, yeah well, the government. Well, we, Hogan was busted back in the day, and they wanted him. Hogan said it was all me, right, with the steroid yeah. deal, and the government. You know, there's been rumors of the way the WWE may operate with some situations with I think talent, and uh, where they push guys too far, which say uh, they do. If you get hurt, that both times I got hurt, I was fired. You know. Let's not beat around the bush, and that's with almost any guy. Because I mean, if you're gonna be paid, they want you to produce, you know. So it's a high pressure, big money game, you know. Uh, there's no union and all that. That's another whole story, which makes it hard for us to have any bargaining power, because they have thousands of kids that will give anything to be to be wrestlers. So you can always go pick another guy, you know. But there's no competition anymore. Yeah, exactly. So, and I'm not trying to bash on Vince. He's a shrewd businessman. He's a genius and the right of where he's taking that business and the money he's made. But, you know, that's stresses and forces that operate on somebody also with his decision making. What was Vince like to you personally? He was tremendous. See, I, that's like I come back with that. He was totally awesome with me, gave me a great opportunity. We had a rapport like, like, like I, I mean, I wasn't even nervous with him after I got to know him. Like, he'd be like, I want you to write a poem tonight. You want to read it? No, I know it's going to be good, you know. I mean, it was like he trusted me and he believed in me and he gave me a great chance. And uh, I mean, I had done a vignette with him. I read him a poem and, uh, you know, uh, he gave me a really great opportunity, you know. So he's just, you know, it's he's a shrewd businessman and, and you know, he's, he's taking care of himself and his business and his family. And, you know, you have to understand his side. There's, there's different sides and forces on every story, you know. And you were doing pretty well as a singles baby face, and then they decided to start teaming you with Animal. Yeah. Uh, how did that all come about? Man, it was like, uh, I'm trying to think who brought me that idea. Maybe Triple H, I'm not sure. Triple H painted the skull face, the face paint, the second paint job, the first one was the butterfly effect, yeah. which they didn't like. <laughs> and Triple H brought me into his locker room, painted that skull on me, and asked Vince to take care of their thoughts. So that was weird, you know? But I, so he I, was in creative at that time. Yeah, yeah, and I was excited and I couldn't believe I was, was going to be part of Legion of Doom because I was a big fan, you know, uh, foot spikes and pads and all that. I was like, wow, you know, man, this is like too good to be true. And things progressed really well, and then you know, it's like all of a sudden we were all released, you know, Animal, uh, Christy Hemi, and me first, you know, so. They, they always run, I think they rush everything with guys and stories and then guys are there and gone and another guy is coming in for whatever reason. I just don't think it's smart you invest in a guy. People get to like him, whether it's a girl or a guy or baby face or whoever. And then the next thing they're gone. So it'd be like changing characters in a sitcom or a TV show where all the characters are loved. The Walking Dead doesn't change all their story lines out every three months, you know. They have a continuity. Did you have any particular match for your time with the Legion of Doom that uh, really stood out? To yeah, you? when we won the belts, man, yeah. Great American Bash. That was awesome. That was from Eminem? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, those guys are cool. Uh, J Joey Mercury, and I knew Nitro from OVW, John Morrison or Hennigan, yeah. uh, AKA, AKA, yeah. And, uh, and Melina, and we had Hemi with us. It was a cool deal, man. It was really awesome. Uh, I just wish we could have done it for three, six. We had the belt, so we dropped them in a ridiculous, goofy way. <laughs> and I, Animal believes that that was motivated by some other thing other than which made sense. Because a lot of stuff they do, it's like, why do they do this? I mean, you hear this all the time. And 
who knows? That's like the, you could ask a magic eight ball and get a better answer than from me, you know? <laughs> was Melita dating Batista at one point? I, I think, I, well, that was alleged. See, I don't know. But I, I don't know. I mean, this is just a rumor that I think maybe they had a, a, an affair, Batista maybe with her. Oh, okay. And I thought she was met, heat involved. Yeah, her. well, I, I think that she was dating either Mercury or Nitro. I think right? it was Nitro. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, it kind of sounded like she was unfaithful, and she was Dave. Or there's nothing they could do because it was Dave. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, she, you know, he didn't force himself on her. She's a grown woman. She obviously said, "Hey, it's cool with me," you know, and made the decision that the person I'm in with you know maybe they weren't uh exclusive all these things they say now i mean if i'm dating somebody i'm not gonna go sleep with somebody else i've never done that numbers game it's just not smart but you know the thing is up there you're working together you're on the road a lot i mean 16 shows a month two 200 280 days a year you're around those people that becomes you're with them more than your family so obviously relationships come out of that time you know it's, I, I wouldn't think it was the most smart idea, but it happens because you're around the people, you know, it's like your family. It is your family, so people end up dating and going out, you know. And what did you like, how did you like working with William Regal and Paul Virtue? Oh, that match was great. And in Finland, right? Yeah. Or would we work, maybe we worked them more. They're tremendous, man. Regal's a genius, okay? Like, uh, uh, like with things to do in a match and ideas that are just like, oh God, I would have never thought of that in a million years, you know? Plus he's also, he's one of those type of workers that when he does something, it looks like he just broke. I mean, if he does a, a, some move on you, it looks like it would have maimed you, right? Yeah. yeah I like Fit Finley and Regal. Yeah, and that virtual guy, that guy was super athletic, man. <laughs> I never understood. Did they do a pirate gimmick with him? They ended up doing a pirate gimmick. Which I think they get ideas. I think I think the Johnny... Uh, Johnny Ace? No, the, the pirate movie that was so popular. Oh, uh, Pirates. The Caribbean thing. with Johnny Depp. I think that movie was popular and they said, hey, let's try to do a character that can piggyback off of that. And it, it, his, that poor guy ended up getting stuck with that because that, that guy was a super athletic guy. I mean had been wrestling, I think, in Europe, right? And came to the America, maybe, to make it. I mean, he, you know, obviously was sacrificing and they stuck him with a goofy thing. It's just like a waste of uh, that guy's ability, you know? Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the internet about uh, you and Animal and something to do with $5,000. Like yeah, I mean, I, I don't really want to bring all that up because I'm trying to work with Animal now because I'm in desperate need of money and Animal is a legend and he's in the Hall of Fame and he... He, he told me that you guys are... Uh, it's all... You've, 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 you've yeah, finished it all. Yeah. And so I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah, that? that's the bottom line. I mean, let me tell you, when I left WWE... Uh, he he I, did I, tell me to ask you one question. He said you'd be able to tell why that was broken up at that time better than he could. The, L, the Legion of Doom yeah. tag team? Well, number one, when I first got fired by them, I blamed Vince. I was mad at it, but it wasn't my fault, you know. As a younger, uh, arrogant, brazen man that had made a lot of money, and my wife, I had marital problems, and I was also doing a lot of things I shouldn't have, you know, because I was coping with stuff in the wrong way, uh, drugs, you know, and that had my mind not functioning on an optimal, smart level to see that I had the biggest lottery ticket handed to me by WWE, you know? And this started when this, it's not all my wife's fault, it's my fault, but that's what, she, she cheated, my wife and me were married, and I, I, I came home Christmas Eve, caught her in the bed with somebody else, and that opened the door to the chaos of me by being hurt, I started going out and partying, because we split up and I was hurt, and I was using drugs and alcohol, and at the same time, I had the biggest opportunity of my life with Undertaker and all these things happening. And little by little, I was losing control of myself, being late for shows, just, you know, stupid, idiotic things. And it's terrible because I threw away the, a big opportunity. And that was going on even with Animal, you know. Yeah, there was some money issues where I loaned him. and But, I mean, I was doing a lot of stuff that was impossible to deal with, you know. Looking back now, I mean, you know, it was I was very stupid. I mean... 
you know, I owe apologies to Vince, Undertaker, and every person that helped me while I was there because they all put a little bit in to see me make it. Triple H, all those guys came and talked to me and said, hey man, you're screwing up, you know, you need to get a hold of, you know, and, but they were saying because you're coming late, you're, you know, things are starting to fall apart and, you know, your world and if you don't stop, you're going to be fired and you may never get back, you know. And that's, that was the biggest thing, how I was handling stuff. It was my fault, you know. And the thing with Animal was disrespectful, a lot of the stuff that happened, because I was just, I was mad and angry and out of control, you know. And uh, Did you think when you were behaving sort of, uh, that way, uh, that because Animal was Johnny Ace's brother, you might be protected a little bit? Uh, since he was not, not well, no, Johnny, I mean, Johnny Ace, me and him never had the best relationship. I don't, I always felt like he thought I was too old and didn't really, I don't think he, he, but he didn't believe it wasn't a hide and right person, you know? Okay. I mean, you have people that believe in you along the way in your life and people that maybe are not as big as a believer, you know, and you got to force, you got to make them believe. Like tri Triple H told me when I got fired the first time and I was trying to get re-signed, I saw him at a show and I said, what's the best advice to so I can get back? He says, don't take no for an answer. I mean, you can't get any better than that. You know, if you want to make it in something, don't take no. I mean, you refuse to be, don't say can't. I mean, if you keep persistently trying, you may not make it in one avenue, but you'll make it, you know? So, yeah. What was your original question? Because, I mean, I'm I was I was just wondering because uh, oh, Johnny Ace was head of talent relations at the time. You were teaming with well, his brother. Well, if you thought maybe you could get away with a little more. Oh, uh, no, no. I thought Johnny Ace would be harder on me, you know? Because okay. I, I went out and I did some stupid things and he came down on me. He's like, you know, we've given you a really big chance, you know? And I, you know, was late for things and stuff. And like, you know, like the, uh, like in Los Angeles, WrestleMania, I was angry because I didn't work. To, I wasn't working the Undertaker. I did the Battle Royal. Well, we had a night meeting at 10 o'clock for the Battle Royal. And I missed that because I was out all night and day partying in Los Angeles. That's stupid, you know? And they, in that Battle Royal, I was the featured guy. Like they had me, I didn't win it, but I had you a big. be the guy. Well, I did a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah I had a, all these cool. I was doing a George yeah. Animal Steel turnbuckle thing. I mean, I was like the featured character, and I mean, it's like you know, just dumb. You know, I get the dumb award. You know, for some of the stuff I did. But uh, no, I mean, I, Johnny's just you know, he's he's all business. You know, and I think you know, uh, he fired me the first time, and I won him back and got re-signed. But you know, I mean, I always was kind of a loose cannon. I, I would. You know, they said you gotta watch your mouth because you're working on TV. I used to curse a lot because I'd get all into my character, and uh, like in football, you know, and yeah. he'd be like, "Man, you, know, you can't do this. You're costing us money editing. It's not professional cursing in the ring or being, you know, just being honest." And uh, no, I don't think he cut me any slack. I think, uh, you know, it's just you make mistakes, man. You look back and you just, and as you're growing up, as you grow up and you realize, you say, "Hey, man, that was that was all me." And you know, you just don't do that again, you know? After WWE run, you went to WWC Puerto Rico for a little while. Up, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was there for a little bit of yeah. that time you were there. Uh, I know you had some issues with pay there, didn't you? Yeah, well, I mean, Carlos, uh, his, uh, his daddy, uh, I think it was, I did a show. I might have did one show, it was a thousand bucks, but the check again, it was bad, you know? Yeah, it was right at Christmas. Yeah. Too, right? yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, I left WWE. I was blessed. I got to, I got to work many years all over. I had so many people help me. Rikishi with NW. I mean, I went everywhere. The Canary Islands, all in Europe. I mean, uh, I mean, I can't even remember. You did the whole Comedia tour too, didn't you? Yeah, man. I, I, I was in the ring with Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, man. You know. Oh, what was that match like? That was insane. Well, poor Hogan, man. That guy has destroyed his body for wrestling. His back was so bad, he couldn't even really finish the match. He shouldn't have been in there, but he was trying to perform. And Who I, was your partner for that one? Well, I, we ran in his heels. I was a heel, and Flair and Hogan, they had, we had four shows there. Yeah. Um, the last two matches, they're like, the heels have to run in because Hogan can't even do a lot of Hogan stuff. Okay. And we, he just fired up on us, knocking us all out of the ring, you know? And uh, you know, I ran and he's like, come on, Hyde Mike. I'm like, damn, he knows my name. I'm like, this is awesome. You know, I mean, Hogan was in Rocky movies, you know, he's like God to me. And uh, I, Ric Flair chopped me when we did some promos to promote the tour. 
all the heels and babies sided off and like got on each side of the camera. And then when the babies left, H Flair's like, I'm gonna start chopping you. Like this is what I'm gonna do to uh, Hogan, but don't sell it. Sell it like the crazy gimmick. So I got like 15 chops from Flair. Flair, I literally in my, I felt like my chest was gonna break, you know? But it was cool because everybody laughed because the insane gimmick looks cool. Did but, you get to have any other contact with Hogan during that time? No, no. I wrestled uh, the Godfather one night, yeah. uh, Eugene one night, and uh, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember who I worked. Uh, made Brutus Beefcake one night. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, it's just, it's been an amazing, insane ride, you know, from football to wrestling, being all over the world. I mean, I did a movie in China with David Carradine before he died, one of his last movies, True Legend. Cool. It's Yao Wu Ping, the guy that did all the Matrix fight scenes. He's considered the godfather of the Chinese wire stuff. Uh, it's the drunken master. We got to do a fight scene in that. It was insane being in China for a month. And, you know, just that's what wrestling is just stunt work, you know? So. And did you do uh, any other movies other than that? Yeah, uh, True Legend and, uh, let me think. I actually got cast in the Big Show movie in New Orleans, Knucklehead. Okay. They didn't want any other guys. I had a fight scene in that. And then there was another movie with Vinnie Jones, a prison fighting movie, with a lot of UFC guys, but it got moved, the budget, through New Orleans, because New Orleans does a lot of filming. But, uh, yeah. no, I was on 18 Boys of Justice. I did, uh, a couple snap, a couple commercials, you know, the body slam thing. Uh, I'm probably forgetting something, man. But Did TNA was, ever talk to you at all after you were released? The first time I was released, I talked to somebody, maybe, I can't remember who it was, about going up there and trying out, but they didn't act like they were too interested because they were like, well, you can drive up here and we'll try to give you a match. I'm like, well, I'm going to Japan getting paid, you know, yeah. like good money. I'm not going to drive all the way to wherever it is and spend, and not even be promised a match. And I'm, it just didn't seem, make sense you know yeah so it never really worked out was that back for zero one japan again after yeah that was when the first time i got released oh, i okay. contacted tna did you ever go back to japan after your second release no no i stayed in canada american indies puerto rico and a lot in europe i really had good fortune with the and an irish company uh, working in ireland england nwe the new wrestling evolution out of italy they ran spain uh, Vampiro was part of that, right? Yeah, in the beginning, but yeah. Kishi was basically the book over there. He brought in all ex WWE guys and European guys. But that that promotion was insane. We got to wrestle in Spain in the Plaza del Toros, which is the bull arenas. Yeah. And some of them were like gladiator with dirt and dust. And you can imagine going out to wrestle in that. It's like you know, yeah. I, I remember gladiator picking up the dirt in his hand. You know, I felt like I was in a movie with. Freaking you like wrestling at dirt because I remember yeah. in Puerto Rico once there was like a rainstorm in that baseball stadium, yeah, yeah. bro. We're not insane. <laughs> we were like yeah. 150 yards from the people. I was like, I don't think they could even see what we're doing out here, you know. And I can't see y'all because all I have is fog right now. Yeah. No. <laughs> and they gave you the belt from Carlito, and you. Uh, yeah, I think I. His brother. I guess. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was crazy, man. It was so hot in Puerto Rico, huh? Dusty oh, Rose was there. Dustin was while, there. Yeah. yeah, he's cool. He's a trip. That's a wild dude, man. Are you uh, are you married or anything now? Or? No, no. I have a girlfriend, but I'm not married. I'm not. Don't think I'll. I don't think I'll try that again. People that do that over and over, they're like they should get awards for that. You know, it's like. Well, for being <laughs> stupid, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Stone Cold told me. I was like, if I mentioned him one time. I said, like, Well, I'm going. You know, separation, divorce. He's like, Ah, oh, kid, I'm on my third one. You know. <laughs> yeah. He can afford it. Though. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was either him or Undertaker. They said, man, you haven't been around pro wrestling very long. If you have to have at least one divorce, you have to go to rehab one time and then something else. Like you have to have been injured severely, almost like, you know, and be released. That was all part of the process of being with WB. So. So what are you doing now? Like, what are you working at all? Now? I worked some indies, not much wrestling, yeah. some autographs. Uh, I had a lawn care business. I had a couple of businesses where I worked for myself, but I had two automobile wrecks that almost killed me, 18-wheeler, and another getting me head on. That's when they did MRIs and said, you really shouldn't wrestle anymore. Uh, so I've been pursuing other jobs, uh, maybe some work in movies, just doing whatever job I could get, if it's a uh, stand-in, whatever. Uh, 
Because I missed a stand-in gig for the Expendables, if you can believe that. Dolph Lundgren needed a stand-in or yeah. shooting New Orleans. And standing gets paid like three fifty a day. All you do is stand there when they adjust the lighting. You know, and I missed that because I didn't have the right number. And I would have met all the Expendables and maybe I would have been Dolph Lundgren. Like famous people, like well, well I'm the same height, you know, I'm fatter now, but at that time I was about the same build. And uh, a stand-in, if you become a stand-in for somebody, like you, that's like a good living, you know? And you're not even famous, so you don't have to be bothered, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pursuing disability right now, which I never wanted to do, but I really have a lot of issues where I'm trying to get it. Uh, but I want to be able to work and be creative. I want to, my goal is to write a book about Heidenreich's plight. That'll be my book. And I, I'm thinking about, I, I'm a writer. I'd like to do it in pictures and poems as a little bit different spin and some writing, but to show my story from a child and how my life's progressed. And I'd like to be an inspirational. At the beginning, I wanted to, I was angry because I didn't make it where I wanted to be in life. But now I think it would be an inspirational book where I'm, finding myself and not, still trying to find myself. You still have some great accomplishments. Yeah, great yeah. Life, but playing. you never see those, you know. The per, I just find like if you're a driven person, you don't ever see. It's more like, well, what do I still want to do or I uh, haven't accomplished, which, you know, keeps you motivated. Yeah, oh, I've been blessed. I mean, a storybook life, you know. Uh, and you're part of this concussions lawsuit, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, because, I mean, I, I know for sure I have CTE. I, well, I don't know for sure because they don't know till they do an autopsy when I'm dead. But a lot of the issues that they have, I have, you know. And from football, considering football, the amount of stuff I went through in wrestling, I mean, it's a good chance. And three severe car wrecks, you know. I mean, uh, the, the the suit is not just about that. It's about WWE treating their employees fairly, and 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 not not just with money. It's about treating them a human. You know, because they, they get away with, uh, they don't take care of people like they should, you know. I'm not saying money or any one thing, it's just stuff that goes on doesn't go on. And the screen, SAG, actors have a union, NFL, NBA, NHL, you know, all these other things that generate money like that and they're at that level. You know, they have a, a union, they have things to better the the uh, the environment they're in it's not just money it's just everything you know i mean there's we don't have a, a mortality rate of any other sport or business profession like in wrestling you know i'm not blaming that on vince but i'm like that stuff that goes on knows some of those reasons are things that could be made so much better where guys would live longer and guys wouldn't have to work hurt because they'd have to be afraid of getting fired you know it's just basic stuff i'm just hoping something good will come out of that I'm not trying to get back at Vince, you know, or whatever. I just think it's something that's fair, you know. I mean, uh, the NFL was, you know, not acknowledging the, the, the danger that's involved with pro football. And, you know, they, they had the, they were ordered to pay out, but it's an appeal. None of those guys have got that. I know guys that are in the league that were on that. It was like a billion dollar settlement. It's all upheld because it's an appeal. So they may never see it, but it's still the point of it, you know, bringing to light how dangerous football is. And guys shouldn't have to push themselves to where Junior Seau, like he killed himself. I know that has to come out of CTE something because that guy was as rock solid as anybody. I played against him. It's heartbreaking when you see these guys take their lives and there's no, there's no drug use, there's no history of any insane behavior and you know they were probably dealing with stuff that they couldn't comprehend and they had no knowledge of that CTE and that probably ended up costing them if they just would have been acknowledged, you know, go to a doctor and say, well, this is what you have, this is why you're feeling like you can't take it, you know, and they're like, okay, well, I'm not crazy because, you know, because I deal with all that too, man, you know, mental stuff, you know. Do you have any advice uh, for aspiring wrestlers? It's a very tough business. I know it's been hard for you, but... I yeah, but it was an amazing ride. It's yeah. totally awesome. Uh, it's like anything. I mean, you have to, if, 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 if it's your dream and, and you want to you know, pursue something, whatever it is, you know, you look at everything. You know, you look at positive, negative, and get as much information from every source as you can and, and, and try to make a decision which you think you can live with, you know? Uh, I mean, I mean, anything you do is dangerous, you know, we can walk outside and something can happen, you know. Yeah. Professional sports, I mean, your body was never constructed or made by whoever created the human race. The body was never made to do that, you yeah. know. 
You get the high school level is bad enough. You go to collegiate level because you're you're abusing, you're you're destroying your body. You're accelerating the, the aging process by all the injuries. And as an athlete is is constructed, he's constructed like a Terminator. You know, I can, I I I'm okay. You know, anybody else would take off six months with an injury, and you know. Yeah. get rehab and then we'll, we'll, we try to get them back in six days or two weeks you know that's just the mentality of all sports and money and all that stuff so you know your body you pay that price you know and lastly is there anything you want to say to your fans that are going to watch this well if they watch it i hope they do i hope they enjoy it because i just want to say thank you man to all of them any day anytime i meet somebody and they say something it automatically gives me an injection of goodness, you know, because I mean, we're all battling, fighting our own demons and stuff. So fans are incredible because you touch someone's life by what you did, you know, so thank them. And just I, I'm grateful for all of them and, uh, you know, everybody along the way that helped me, you know, all the people in my life, coaches, trainers, everybody, you know, you and I, I when I saw it, I'm like, holy, I'm like, hey, man, that's my brother from back in the day. So I, I, my brain's getting forgetful, you know. And where can people follow you on social media? Do you have any social media or anything? Like Facebook? I don't do that Twitter much, man. I'm not very good with that. I know everybody says you should do that to promote yourself. Yeah. And I, I'd like to. I hope I can get this book written. And I'd like to do like some a book of poems also and maybe some other stuff. Calendars and stuff and just creative stuff, you know? If somebody I want, wants to book you for like an autograph appearance, do you have an email or any way uh, for them to contact you? Well, yeah, I guess I yeah, might just say my email. Say, or, my, say your email, yeah. Okay, uh, if you want to book or reach Heidenreich, you can email me, email me at uh, letters, all small letters, bbjheidenreich at yahoo.com, and that's from Big Bad John and OVW. A small letters, bbjheidenreich at yahoo.com, and I'll get back to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Okay, I really brother. Thank y'all. I hope I didn't talk too much. You all right, brother? He's like, shut up already. <laughs> no, we appreciate it. No. The answers. Uh, best of luck. Well, I get into it when I'm talking about it. I'm reliving it. So that's why that energy comes. You probably see me like, <laughs> freaking, you know, you know, just like, I'm, it's exciting. So thank you.